Evening, everyone. Love to see you all. Uh, welcome to the RSA. Welcome to RSA House. I'm Andy Haldane. I'm the Chief Executive uh, here. Uh, we're in the great room, but we've also got lots of people uh, watching uh, online uh, on the live stream of tonight's very uh, special event. It's an event uh, that the RSA is doing in partnership with the Camino Foundation. Uh, it's a partnership that we're delighted to have had over many, many decades uh, now, uh, latterly uh, deeply involved uh, in our Pupil Design Awards uh, scheme. I'm particularly pleased to be partnering this year, because this year is actually uh, the 50th uh, anniversary year of the Camino Foundation, so happy 50th birthday, uh, Camino. Uh, looking forward to my own 50th in a few years. <laughs> It's not wasn't a joke. Um, uh, the jumping off point for tonight's discussion uh, is last year's uh, report of the Times Education Commission. I'm sure you all have seen and read about that. It's a pretty far-reaching and hard-hitting inquiry into education from early years right through to lifelong learning. Uh, and those proposals, if they were to be enacted, I would, I think, mark a pretty significant shift uh, in the UK's education system, both what is taught and indeed how we go about uh, teaching it. And the proposals in that commission are very well aligned uh, with the RSA's own mission, our so-called Design for Life uh, programme. That's our manifesto for the regeneration of the three Ps, that is to say people, <coughs> uh, place uh, and planet, <coughs> unlocking the potential in people uh, of all ages, learners of all ages. <coughs> and I hope among the things this evening can achieve is for us at the RSA to have a somewhat clearer roadmap of where we go next with our education initiatives, picking up themes, some of the themes from the Commission, from tonight's discussion, and working in partnership uh, with Camino. <coughs> so to kick off the conversation, I'm delighted to say we've got three exceptionally distinguished and well-qualified uh, guest speakers. I'm taking them in turn uh, to my left, uh, Rachel Sylvester, as you all know, political columnist at the Times and of course chair of that Times Education Commission. And having finished that Herculean task last year, Rachel's now chairing the Times Health Commission, which means that among other things, Rachel is surely a glutton for punishment. Um, next to Rachel is, is David Blunkett, Lord Blunkett, former Labour Secretary of State uh, for Education and Employment, among other things. Uh, David is now Professor of Politics and Practice at the University of Sheffield. Uh, David, a marvellous institution, we would both uh, believe. Uh, and finally, uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Baker, Lord Baker, who held, as you all know, several Conservative ministerial positions, including Education and Science Secretary, during which time he introduced the national curriculum. And among other things, uh, Kenneth is now chair of the Baker Deering Educational uh, Trust. We're going to hear first from Rachel, then a uh, response from Lords Blunkett and Baker, and then we'll open it out to conversation, including in the room. So please bring along some questions, either in the room or online. We'll try to get through as many of those as possible and wrap up sharp at 7 PM. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage Rachel Sylvester. Rachel. Thank you, Andy, and thanks to all of you for coming. I can see some familiar faces in the audience who gave evidence to us on the commission, and it's really great to be here. Uh, and I was thinking as I was uh, deciding what to say today that the RSA is actually the perfect place for this discussion to take place because it embodies the change that's needed in our education system. It's the Royal Society with the encouragement of arts, manufacturers and commerce. So it understands that there's no conflict between the arts and science or between culture and business. And indeed, the chief executive is an economist, so that says it all. And this is precisely the breadth and collaboration that's so desperately needed in our schools, colleges and universities, but which is currently missing. 
So as Andy said, it's almost a year since the Times Education Commission published its final report and the conclusions seem more relevant than ever. So just to summarise our recommendations, we called for a radical overhaul of the curriculum and assessment system with a British baccalaureate offering a wider range of subjects at 18 and a slimmed down set of exams at 16. We proposed an electives premium for all schools to be spent on activities including drama, music, dance and sport. We recommended changes to inspection with a broader school report card and Ofsted turned into a collaborative helping hand rather than a terrifying big stick. We said well-being must be at the heart of education with a counsellor in every school and an annual mental health survey of the young. We called for more investment in the early years and an overhaul of childcare to put a greater focus on education rather than just babysitting. And I'm pleased to say that both Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer have praised the work of the Education Commission and told us separately that they agree with many of its conclusions. In fact, some of them have already been announced as policy. But I think it's fair to say that every single one of these recommendations is more pertinent and more urgent now than it was when our report came out last June. The rise of artificial intelligence and chat GBT has accelerated the need for our education system to hone the human skills that children will increasingly rely on at work. The jobs of the future will require people to be able to differentiate from the <coughs> machines, not just replicate them. Pupils should be learning curiosity, empathy, creativity, originality, communication skills and, a, and an ability to work with other people rather than just being taught to replicate the robots. And of course, children growing up in this brave new world must also learn how to analyse and interrogate information rather than simply accumulating facts. They should be encouraged to challenge and question what they hear instead of focusing on rote learning and regurgitating knowledge. There's an enormous opportunity here for the education system to harness the power of technology to personalise learning and reduce the workload on teachers but AI does also call into question not only what is taught in schools, but also how pupils are assessed. And this is, of course, about the economy as well as the education system. Business leaders told us on the Commission that they increasingly took no notice of grades and qualifi qualifications because they didn't consider them a useful way to find the best new recruits. They run their own assessment systems. James Dyson, the inventor, put it well. He told us, the system doesn't measure creativity, it measures what you can remember of other people's facts. And he said that without a greater focus on originality and innovation in education, the British economy would simply continue to flatline. When our report came out last June, the mini-budget was not yet a twinkle in Liz Truss and Quasi Kwarteng's eyes, so now there's an even greater need than there was then to boost productivity and kickstart growth. Then, of course, there is Ofsted. The Education Commission heard that the school's inspectorate was too often operating a reign of terror that was doing nothing to drive school improvement. And, of course, that message was amplified in the most appalling way by the tragic death of Ruth Perry. The measures and methods used by Ofsted are too narrow and they're disadvantaging pupils as well as too often causing terrible distress to staff with some sometimes dreadful consequences. And over the last 12 months, the long tail of the pandemic has highlighted the stubborn inequalities in our system, with too many children still absent from school, particularly the poorest. One of the core roles of education should be to level the playing field between advantaged and disadvantaged pupils, but instead, the attainment gap has grown. And the mental health crisis in schools has become even more acute since we launched our report. When the Education Commission was taking evidence, we were told that one in six young people suffered from a probable mental health disorder. Now, as chair of the Times Health Commission, I've been told that it's one in four. One in four. That's a truly shocking figure, which should surely be a wake-up call. So the Times Education Commission was a, a strange innovation, a kind of mini think tank within a newspaper. And we operated in an unusual way for a paper we held fortnightly evidence sessions, regional roundtable meetings, youth panels and parent focus groups. But we deliberately set out to talk to as wide a range of people as possible, going beyond the usual suspects, 
to see what the country needed from the education system, not just what the education system wanted to offer the country. The approach was evidence-based and non-ideological, seeking to learn the lessons from the best examples, both in this country and abroad, in a dispassionate, pragmatic fashion. And I think that's why both parties have been able to find something to approve of in what we found. In all, we heard from more than 600 people, including business leaders, cultural figures and scientists, as well as teachers, pupils, parents, policy experts and a few politicians. What came across loud and clear was that the current system just isn't delivering what the economy needs, what parents want or what pupils deserve. The one-size-fits-all, tick-box, mark scheme mentality isn't drawing out the talent of every child, nor is it creating the workforce the country needs to thrive in the modern world or developing the well-rounded citizens of the future. The evidence really was compelling from across all parts of society and there was a remarkable level of consensus about what needed to change. And that was about introducing more breadth and breaking down those false divides between knowledge and skills, humanities and sciences, employment and education. The way we shop, tra work, travel, bank and watch television has changed utterly over the past decades, but our schools just haven't kept pace. I'll never forget the school leader at our round table in Cornwall who explained the frustration of working in the current system. She said, we're preparing children for a world that doesn't exist. And what struck me as I flew around the world visiting high performing education systems is that England, and it is more England than the rest of the United Kingdom, is increasingly an outlier. In Estonia, which has the best system in Europe according to the OECD, children learn robotics from the age of seven. They use virtual reality headsets to bring geography, chemistry and biology lessons to life. I spoke to one teacher who'd been absolutely terrified by a snake in the rainforest. The, the curriculum is designed to encourage what they call 21st century competences, creativity, problem solving, teamwork, entrepreneurship and communication, all the skills and dispositions that business leaders told us they wanted. In the Netherlands, pupil well-being is valued just as much as grades. In Finland, children are taught how to identify fake news in media literary, literacy classes set up because they're worried about the threat from Russia. In California, I visited the Khan Lab School where the teaching assistants are pupils and the education is personalised with mixed age classes and no grades. I met Sal Khan, the founder of the online Khan Academy, which has 135 million registered users worldwide. And he pointed out that the traditional education system too often treats children as passive recipients of information when they should be encouraged to be active learners. Interestingly, he thinks this may be contributing to the mental health crisis in schools because teen teenagers who are used to curating their Spotify playlists or their FIFA teams are infantilised and disempowered when they get into the classroom. In Singapore and Shanghai, education has pivoted to put much more focus on creativity, but we're still languishing behind. The case for reform is powerful and multifaceted, economic, social, technological, scientific, and I would say also political. I think there's a real appetite for change among voters. A YouGov poll for the Education Commission found that two-thirds of parents said they didn't think the education system was preparing their child for work or life. Imagine a political leader who could promise to turn that around. I think priorities have shifted since the pandemic. Parents now overwhelmingly prioritise their children's well-being over academic attainment. Our poll found that 65% of parents believe that the education system puts too much emphasis on tests and qualifications compared with only 11% who think it doesn't put enough focus on exams. There's a real opportunity here for a party that would seize it. And there's actually a remarkable level of agreement across party lines in some ways. The Prime Minister endorsed the idea of a British baccalaureate during the Tory leadership contest last year. His recent announcement on maths to 18 was in my view a step in the right direction and at least opened up the debate about post-16 education, although there's a huge way to go and it's not enough. 
Starmer also told me that he's interested in assessment reform and he's pledged a review of the curriculum if Labour gets into power to make school more relevant and um, topical to work. Politicians across the board are now falling over themselves rightly to support apprenticeship and skills. Early years education has become one of the key electoral battlegrounds for the next election after the Chancellor's recent budget annou announcement on childcare which followed Labour's own pledges on reform. So the Education Commission uh, advocated a 15-year strategy for education drawn up in consultation with business leaders, scientists, local mayors, civil leaders and cultural figures we said that education should be above short-term party politics. That may be a bit unrealistic, so close to a general election, but I do hope that enlightened self-interest may focus the minds of the politicians and that people in this room may help do so. All elections ultimately come down to hope versus fear. It's time for a change versus don't let the other lot wreck it. If Sunak and Starmer want to make a positive pitch to the electorate, then I would say that a promise to create a school system fit for the 20, 21st century, broader, more creative, more compassionate, more relevant, would encapsulate the optimism that will be key to unlocking the votes for change, whether that's in Workington or Stevenage. Rachel, thank you for taking that out so clearly and concisely and comprehensively. And, um, and in response, could I go to David to you first for your thoughts and reflections on what you've heard from, from Rachel? Well, firstly, I, I thought the existence of the Commission and its report were a crucial part of getting education back on the national agenda. I don't know whether Ken agrees, but uh, I think in both your time, Ken, and in mine, there was a much greater focus by the main political parties on education as an absolutely key element in both liberating talent and in terms of the economy and the future of the country. And I fear that, of course, there's a tension on things like the, 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 the current uh, dispute and the strikes, but I fear that there is nowhere near the attention from the major political parties Obviously, the SNP have got other things on their mind at the moment. Uh, and the Liberal Democrats, because of their sparsity in the Commons, don't get the attention. But the two main political parties on the national scene really do need to return to seeing education as the fundamental building block for people to succeed, whether it's in terms of uh, individual fulfilment or whether it's in terms of actually being able to compete on the global stage now we're outside the European Union and to embrace many of the things that uh, Rachel has described in terms of the very big changes that are taking place in society and our economy. But there are some real challenges. It's not just that the Conservative Party obviously and clearly for political reasons would want to retain a more traditional uh, base and therefore would have to respond to that in terms of fear that educational change means diluting <coughs> quality <coughs> or that the Labour Party are, to, to be honest, a little bit of se uh, afraid of saying anything too radical in order not to uh, frighten the horses, although the horses uh, take their own road if you don't frighten them in the right direction. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's actually also that there are some paradoxes here. Uh, I think many of us would agree that we need to shake up the curriculum, that we need to liberate syllabuses within the curriculum so that teachers can inspire, can motivate, can do what they came in to do as professionals, which is to light that candle and to want youngsters to love learning rather than to be put off by it. But actually, if you talk to people in the profession, and one of my uh, daughter-in-laws is a teacher, they are really, really beleaguered, and therefore the promise of radical change becomes more of a threat than it actually becomes a, a promise. And that is a real problem for us, because we all know that we need to bring about change, but we somehow need to do it with the grain of what teachers are about and what they themselves want and how they 
feel, and I didn't get that right. Estelle Morris was much better at it as my deputy uh, at the time than I was. But we knew that there had to be change, but the resistance to Curriculum 2000, which was the change brought about then, was quite substantial, both from within the profession and from those who are always looking to divide people. The people who can't see that scholarship and building skills go hand in hand. That, as you've said, Rachel, that science and arts and creativity are not opposites. They are absolutely integral to each other. That actually developing the social well-being of youngsters and having good outcome measures in terms of their learning, their pedagogy, go hand in hand. I, do, I happen to have got a PGC from a very, very long time ago, so I probably ought to discount it because <coughs> whatever it was that I learned in the PGC has long gone. But I'll finish on this, Andy, because you want us to make brief contributions. If we don't radically change what we're doing in schools, we'll turn people off the very things that they need to learn most. Of course, about how to teamwork, about being able to socialise in a world where many people now communicate uh, by their smartphones and are online and therefore don't meet all that often and therefore communicate in quite different ways to my day. They even communicate across the dining table by texting each other. Uh, and, you know, you can't get people off the phone when you're having dinner with them. I sometimes want to just confiscate them uh, in order to be able to have a sensible conversation. We need to, to have that, but we also need to teach the basic digital skills. We need youngsters to be not tested constantly, but to have some outcome measures because Simply saying, you know, love learning is absolutely fine. I'm totally in favour of it. But I'll tell you two things. One is that schools in the constituency that I used to represent when I became education secretary were a basket case because so many people thought that those children couldn't really succeed to the, the levels that needed. Third, bottom in terms of young people going into higher education, a kind of writing off which was desperately depressing and was totally unacceptable. Mm. Yes. And secondly, <coughs> that we do need to ensure that we don't rely on memory in a world where, where understanding how to access information and how to use it, and yes, like Finland, how to be po uh, politically literate, because that's what you were really saying, Rachel, is crucial. But here's the thing. I succeeded because I had a bloody good memory. It's not what it was. But I went to evening class to get my O-levels, as they were then, and A-levels. And I did O-levels one night a week for one year. I did the first two, and then another two, and then another two. And if I hadn't had a good memory, because of the nature of the examination, I wouldn't have succeeded. I wouldn't have had the confidence to go on. I even managed to pass O-level physics and believe me, I know nothing about physics. <laughs> I didn't then, but I did have a political trait, and I'll finish on this. It was to be able to write ambiguously. <laughs> I, knew, I knew that the examiner knew what they were talking about, and I just hoped and prayed that if I got it right, they might think that I did know what I was talking about <laughs> when I didn't. Thanks very much. <laughs> David, thank you for that. And, and Ken, if I could turn the floor to you. Yes, certainly. I think the importance of a meeting like this, and I hope there will be more like it in different, uh, in, in, in different institutions, is that this is preparatory to the next election. And I think, uh, I believe that the education system of our country now needs absolutely radical change. And I'm trying to persuade each of the parties, the Labour, uh, my own party, and the Liberals, to put this into their manifestos. If they do not put it into their manifestos, very little will happen. And if you look at the manifestos of political parties in the past of education, they've been usually fairly trivial. A little bit on primary, a little bit on fresh start, a little bit on special education, and we'll build schools well and we'll get rid of the best or whatever it may be. 
I think that what's gone wrong in education is so fundamental you need much more than that. And um, so therefore, uh, if we don't do that, what will happen is that the Department of Education will continue to run the education system. For the last 10 years, it is the Department of Education that has run education and not the ministers. I've known all 10 of them, and I dare say that even in this distinguished audience, you wouldn't be able to name the 10 from all of the people here today. They've disappeared into obscurity, they had no influence whatsoever on education, they had no original ideas. The department was in fact run by the Department of Education, which I think is now a moribund department. And so that could happen unless that in fact there are radical proposals in the next manifestos. And you have to start by recognising what has happened. The best of the uh, uh, Secretaries of State was Michael Gove, but he introduced a most extraordinary curriculum called EBAC and Progress 8 of eight academic subjects. They are the political philosophy of an American education called Hirsch, who says that if you, if you just um, give children of the most disadvantaged areas in the slums of the Bronx and what have you, academic subjects, they will rise automatically. No American state has followed this, no group of American schools has done, but that was the policy imposed upon all our schools in 2010. It's known as EBAC and Progress 8. Eight academic subjects. Two English, one math, three sciences, a foreign language, history and geography. Doesn't that sound so reasonable? It's a grammar school curriculum. It's a private school curriculum. It does not really affect really at least a third, if not a half, of ordinary children. And that is the experiment that has been imposed upon us for the last 10 years. It has not made any improvement in disadvantaged children. When it started, there were 300,000 disadvantaged children. There are still 300,000 disadvantaged children. It has totally failed. And so the first step of the radical change is to persuade each party to put into their manifestos to abandon EBAC and Progress 8. If they don't, the Department of Education will, will defend them vigorously. I can just imagine the, the discussions, the, the arguments they're putting forward. Very expensive, too difficult, teachers won't like them, etc., 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 etc. So I'm advocating a very radical change. Now, the commission that Rachel started was one of eight. There were eight commissions so far, or reports, recommending uh, changes. They all came to the same conclusion that the present curriculum was not fit for purpose, nor was the examination system fit for purpose. All of them said that. The first one was from the High Minister of St Paul's School for the private schools, a very good report. Then there was Rachel's. Then there was a report from the Select Committee on Employment House of Lords, which made a hundred recommendations. Then there was a report from the Institute of Government, and there was eventually a report from Blair as well. All of them said the same, and the government has dismissed all of them and said there is no need for such a radical change. So I've got a big problem in persuading my own party, in fact, to recognise that there should be change. Uh, the change that is needed, it was very interesting, Peter Hennessy, the economic and political commentator, about 18 months ago, uh, wrote a very interesting piece um, talking about the three great issues for the next 10 years in our, in our social and political lives. And he compared them to the three great issues of the Attlee government. The three great issues of the Attlee government were decolonisation, nationalisation and health service. That dominated, as it were, the, the Attlee years. The three that he recommended was a social care system that really did help the elderly properly, which we haven't yet got. Secondly, building houses on a really huge scale to provide housing. And thirdly, a complete reform of technical education. And that is needed. You must appreciate that since 1870, the, the Forster Act of 1870, the Department of Education has only focused upon academic education. They have never actually had to publish and define a, a, a technical vocational curriculum. They have not actually designated any exams at all that are technical or vocational. And so all that, all that time, there's been this a, a huge emphasis upon academic education. And there's now got to be a fundamental change. Um, uh, way back in 2008, 
Um, an old colleague of mine, Ron Deering, some of you may have remembered him. He was one of these people who left school at 16 and ended up as a permanent secretary. And I knew him when I was responsible for the post office in the earth that year, as he ran the post office, it ran very well. When he retired, I appointed him to the Polytechnics. Um, I was actually the last Secretary of State that defended the Polytechnics as separate institutions, and it's been a great mistake to have not made them what they, what they are today. That's by the by. But we said that what is needed are proper technical schools in the education system. We had 300 in 1945 when we had the tripartite system of grammar schools, technical schools and high schools. It was the system that Germany adopted in 1945, which they still have, and it's one of the reasons why they are richer and more prosperous and more successful than we are. And so we said we must have create a new technical school. And these are called university technical colleges. The model is this. They go from 14 to 18, and the curriculum is that from 14 to 16, the youngsters will spend at least two days in workshops working with their hands, designing things on their computers, or enjoying work experience with the local companies. The other 60%, they would do the academic subjects. When they become 16, it reverses. 60% outside, 40% academic. And um, uh, I persuaded Adonis and uh, Ed Balls to support two, and then I, support, oh, I persuaded Osborne and Cameron to support 24. The trouble was that Michael Gove was totally opposed to it. He did not believe there should be technical schools. He refused to promote them. He cut our money, and so I had to set up a charity to promote them. And we have now got 44 of these colleges. They have over 20,000 students, and they are some of the best schools from destination data in the country. 24% of the... Now, we take quite often difficult children at 14, because we get quite a lot of disgruntled dispassionate children, fed up with it, they want a fresh start, and we really transform them. Um, and 24% of them now become apprentices, usually at 18. I don't know, do you know what an 18-year-old apprentice earns? If the, the, the qualification to become an apprentice at 18 is to have one A-level and one technical qualification. Do you know what the a Navy pays for people at, at 18? £35,000 a year. The big car companies will pay for those sort of people up to 25 or maybe 30,000. That's a lot of money, more than a student is likely to earn in many cases when they leave after university. And so 24% of our become, become apprentices, 50% go on to university only to do STEM subjects, 75% do STEM subjects, double the national average. The others get local jobs. Now that's interesting, they get local jobs because the companies in their town need skilled operatives. And so where they are, you don't get the drift of students down to the southeast and down to London because already the governing body of these colleges is in control of the local employers and the university. And so we want more of these, but I don't believe that over the next 10 years many new schools will be built. A new school costs about 12, 12 to 15 million. And I think more schools will be closed in the next 10 years than opened because there's a declining number in students. Mm. Having said that, uh, I want the, what we've learned in the, in, 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 in the University Technical College movement is that you, you can change people's attitude if they learn with their hand as well as their mind. There's a very good book by David Goddard about 18 months ago on heart, mind, uh, heart, heart, mind, and, 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 and heart, mind, and hand. And we've discovered that by giving youngsters at 14 or 16 the power to master tools, the power to make things with their hands, is transformation and behavior. We don't have disruption in our colleges. We don't, we don't expel un, un, unruly, we only expel somebody who's actually Hit, a, hit, hit somebody or attack somebody in, 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 in their class or the teacher. And as a result, we have hardly any expulsions. So these, what I've learned is that technical education can be transformational for many young people. And I want that lesson to spread throughout our education system over the next 10 years. Uh, because I think that's the best contribution we can make to making our country successful. Okay, and thank you.
Three fantastic contributions. So uh, please prepare your questions either online or in the room. Uh, but just to kick us off, um, I'm building on what you've, all three of you have said. How can it be that if teachers want it, parents want it, pupils want it, voters want it, how is it the two main political parties don't want it or can't see fit to put it in their manifestos? How can we be locked in that logjam? Rachel? I think they're <laughs> nervous that anything radical, as David said, anything radical, anything that rocks the boat might put someone off. They're locked in this sort of dance of despair, if you like. Um, and I think if uh, whoever breaks that dance and, you know, moves into a different quick step or whatever, there's a huge opportunity for them to create a positive message. I mean, this, the, at the moment, the local elections, as a sort of for, terrible foreshadowing of the general election, it's just all this awful negative campaigning, horrible posters. Uh, if, if, you know, if Starmer wants to create a pitch, New Britain, a different kind of uh, tone, then I would say education is the key for him. And it's also one that really resonates because he himself, you know, he was the, get, um, first in his family to go, go to university. He does understand, um, you know, how hard it was for his father. Uh, so, and for Sunak too, it's the, it could be the key to showing he does, is committed to levelling up. He is committed to social justice as well as economic prosperity. It seems to me it's the one way to square that circle. Uh, so I just hope that they decide to follow the optimism route rather than the pessimism route. David and Ken, on the same point. David? Well, David, I, I was just going to say, I, I think part of the difficulty, and it's historic, is that the debate around education publicly outside the professions and those who are interested and committed and are either here or online tonight has been dominated by those who are vehemently against change and believe, as I tried to say earlier, that any kind of radical change <coughs> automatically equals dilution of quality and therefore all must have prizes, therefore it's going to be a bad thing. E even something as limited as introducing AS levels to try and broaden the post-16 experience fell foul. Now, we might not have introduced it terribly well, but I was incredibly disappointed that the only leading university that defended AS levels was Cambridge. Others were quite happy to, to go back to a focal concentration so that when students arrive at university, unlike other parts of the world, they are somehow ready to go immediately into the pipeline, into a limited uh, subject area, rather than into yes. an experience. Absolutely. My youngest son is at UCLA in the States for all kinds of reasons. His grandmother uh, lives about 30 miles away and he wanted to experience it as a dual citizen. The first year, he, he had nine broad subjects each semester, a taster, of the world before having to choose for the set third and fourth year absolute focus and concentration. We do the opposite. We say to students, pick it, and you're in it. And by the way, when you're in it, you're unlikely to be able to share it. So if you're in one faculty, you'll not be able to share very much <coughs> with another. It, it's a, we run a crazy system. I mean, I'm teaching in it, in higher education. And students manage but very often they're not inspired and they don't cross, they don't do a, a Leonardo, they don't actually learn enterprise or creativity. They go down the tram line and we call it education. Okay. Um, to answer your question, uh, I think the real reason why the parties are so pathetic in this is that most MPs have no idea what is happening in their schools locally. When they go to a school, they like primary to, like to visit the primary one because they want a jolly good picture. If they do the secondary, they'll go to the prize day. Um, they don't have no idea of what is happening and they like to speak to the six forms because they might have votes. And they have no nature. And I discovered that when I was in the Thatcher cabinet. Because when setting up the national curriculum, I had eventually to present to the cabinet a curriculum for each of the subjects, maths, English, history, and all the rest of it. And it was usually 30 to 40 pages, 
and I knew that many of them had not read them to the end, but Margaret always had, there were always old markings on her last page, but the others hadn't. And they basically extrapolated from their own education, which was public schools and grammar schools. And, and, and they were looking backwards all the time. And so that's one of the reasons why the politicians are not right in the right, right sort of area. Um, the other thing is that um, when you're in office, uh, politicians on the whole are very reluctant to change things. Uh, you're going to have, if you're going to change anything in education, there will be battles. There's no question about it. There are strong vested interests in the whole of education, but you've got to be very determined. And that does mean locking down into quite a long programme of change. Um, when I first took over in the Department of Education, I had, I had a very good permanent secretary and three very good deputy secretaries. Uh, not really one of them really agreed with me at the beginning, but I first had long discussions with them, arguing the cases out for what we said in our manifesto. And then I said, I would like actually, just not to speak to the deputy secretary and the permanent secretary, I'd like to speak to the under secretaries. And these were people who had never really been allowed to voice anything. And I discovered in the under secretary situation, there were lots of people who wanted change. And slowly we won this argument. And you can win that argument if in fact you have a brief from a manifesto. And so that's why the manifestos are so important. Let's go uh, in the room and collect a couple of questions uh, in the room for the panel. Who wants to just wait for the mic? Uh, we'll take one here. We'll, we'll take, get a couple and then pass those back to the audience. Hi, Dr. Sue Roffey, University College London. Um, first of all, thank you, Rachel and Anthony, for the Times Education Commission report, which I thought was an absolutely wonderful um, piece of research and writing. My issue really is about um, the curriculum. And the what? one of the things the around... Curriculum. The curriculum. The what? Curriculum. Oh, the curriculum. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is, is about the curriculum. And in particular, you've already mentioned the great problems that we have with mental health and the deterioration of mental health for young people. And social and emotional learning is promoted by UNESCO, MGIP, um, the OECD, but it's hardly mentioned here. And one of the things that has struck me very forcibly in the last few months is that we've had over and over again stories in the press about toxic masculinity and um, the Met and people saying we need to vet people better and also in areas of the national service. And why are we not actually addressing things like that in social emotional learning from the time children go to school until the time they leave? Thank you. Let's take a question over this side of the room and then we'll go back to the gentleman here with the, the cap on. Just that? Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Nathaniel Adam Tobias Coleman. I'm a member of the Section 28 generation. I was not liberated by my education, I was oppressed by it. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the uh, repeal of Section 28, Britain's law banning the promotion of homosexuality in England and Wales. And it was a local government act that brought this clause in, yet it was circulars from ministers of education that really did the work. When you were Minister of Education, uh, David Blunkett, uh, in July 2000, a month after it was, uh, Section 28 was abolished in Scotland, you introduced a circular of education uh, telling people that uh, children should be taught about the nature of marriage and its importance for family life. With that, you reinscribed the distinction that had been enacted in Section 28 between so-called real and so-called pretended family relationships. In October 1987, two months prior to the introduction of the, uh, Section 28 in the Local Government Bill, uh, you, Kenneth Baker, uh, introduced the circular saying there is no place in any school, in any circumstances, for teaching which advocates homosexual behavior, which presents it as the norm, or which encourages homosexual experimentation by pupils. Capital Gay, at the time, uh, commented that 
This was of historic significance because it amounts to an official ministerial declaration that homosexuality is against public policy. My question to you is this. Don't say gay laws, don't say trans laws abound and are a matter of electoral uh, politics right now. Given the damage that Section 28 and your ministerial circulars has done, what account do you now give of the ways in which your decisions yeah, well, wronged yeah. us? Well, for, firstly, we, we learn from the past, we don't live in it. Secondly, you're entirely wrong, I'm afraid, about the July circular in 2000. It was based on a wide consultation. It was the first ever sex and relationship guidance note to schools. It was intended to free people from the fear of teaching diversity and being able to be open about relationships and the emotions and the commitments that go with it. And yes, it did preach, uh, if you want to put it that way, the idea of stability in relationships because I still believe that that is important, but that's stability in whatever the relationship, whatever the coming together. So I'll, I'll take you on any time about the sexual relationship guidance that we put through. Again, in the teeth of opposition from people who thought we were going far, far too far in saying what people are, they are, and we live and work and embrace and love each other in whatever way is most appropriate. But we do it in relationships that seek to build that uh, commitment and stability rather than uh, actually undermine it. So you, you can have a good go if you want. I've come a long way over the 75 years that I've lived so far, a long way. I, I fear that going back to the past is not helpful, but I think we should learn from it. I learned, I learned that some of the attitudes that I had many years ago were totally inappropriate and had to be laid aside. And I learned one other thing. You take people with you by sensible dialogue and argument. If we want to go down a rabbit hole in terms of creating artificial divisions over identity politics, we can do it. We've seen it in the States. It's highly dangerous from all points of view, and we should avoid it like the plague. I, I fully support that, and I strongly supported the changes that David did bring in. Could I answer your mental health question? There is real concern today about the mental health of children as a result of COVID. Um, absentee rates in the disadvantaged areas as high as 15%. That, that's really appalling. They cannot get the children to go back to school. Um, and wh why is that? Well, one of the reasons is they're not finding school interesting enough. And that is because of the curriculum. Because what had happened as a result of that imposing this EBAC curriculum is that design technology, which I introduced, which is the design technology bit of it, those lessons have fallen by 70%. But when it comes to the cultural subjects, very much to the heart of the RSA. All those cultural subjects of drama, dance, performing arts, music and art have all dropped by 40 or 50 percent. But those are very often the very subjects which youngsters want to do, particularly now in the performing arts. Because of Netflix and streaming, the British entertainment industry is going to produce more original work next year than Hollywood. And so there's a huge demand for jobs in that area. And I'm very proud of the fact that eight of the UTCs actually do actually produce children. We've got one at Elstree next to the film studio. We've got one in the Salford Keys next to television studios. And the youngsters are picking up not only the technologies of the entertainment industries, but also the creative side as well. We have a UTC in the East End of London that does creative writing uh, with the National Theatre. And there are jobs in this area. So make the curriculum interesting enough for students to come back. That, I think, is the compelling interest of the next government. I've got a couple of questions here online. I've asked Rachel to pick one or both of those up. And the first one is about um, education in preparation for a climate-changed world. What might be done on that front? And the second is about teacher recruitment. 
of the crisis in teacher recruitment and how to make a teaching career something that genuinely is life-changing. Yeah. Rachel, either of those you wanted to pick up? Yeah, I'll pick up the teacher recruitment, um, which also, I think, <coughs> applies to teacher retention. I think they're both really interesting subjects, though. Um, and I think, again, it goes back to what and how we teach. And teaching has become disempowering for teachers because there, it's a whole list of mark schemes and um, boxes you have to tick, endless um, data drops for the Ofsted inspection, uh, and all the creativity, all the kind of personal human side to teaching, all the inspiration, which is what teachers are drawn to it for, has been drummed out. I remember one of our commissioners, Lucy Kellaway, um, who founded Now Teach, she was an FT journalist, then became a teacher. She talked in um, very early on in one of our commission meetings, something I never forgot, that um, it, she was in an uh, economics class, GCSE economics class, and a kid asked an absolutely brilliant question about tax. And she could have spent the whole hour answering that question, getting the kids to work out the answer, discussing it in a really interesting, creative way. But she couldn't, because she had six slides she had to get through to get them for their GCSE mark scheme. Um, and it was boring for them, boring for her, really frustrating uh, and demoralizing and I think I actually think I know money is a big issue at the moment but I think that sort of lack of agency that people feel is what we heard was drumming people out at least if not more than money actually uh, and that it's not any longer um, interesting to be a teacher or fulfilling uh, and it's just sort of drudgery and and um, uh, 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 sort of following one box after another uh, and actually teachers are really interesting inspiring people who are, want to inspire some, others. There are some Rachel who are trying to break out of that. I went to the XP school in Doncaster last year and they were, I, I don't, I, I, even when I came out having I mean, listened to them I wasn't sure how they were managing it which was to put together a cross-curricular uh, set of syllabuses, a way of teaching and at the same time manage close to the GCSEs to get the youngsters to actually do re and sufficiently well to be able to progress. So there are experiments. How the hell do we scale them up? How do we give confidence to teachers to break that terrible cycle that Lucy was describing to you? Because if the teachers are, are bored and fed up, think what the pupils are. <laughs> exactly. Let's get back in the room. On the green agenda, on the green agenda. Yeah, Ken, and then we'll get the room. On the Green Agenda, um, the only way that you can study climate change in the present curriculum is to take uh, Geography A-levels. I know that because one of my grandsons has just done that. And I said, Geography, that's always rather a soft subject, isn't it? He said, no, it's the only way that I can study climate. But the trouble about the Green Agenda, it covers all sorts of things. It covers the carbon cycle in, in, in chemistry, it covers electric cars, it covers alternative fuels, it, and we're just not touching it at all at the moment in our education system. There's really an absence of this in teaching. It's difficult because it's multidisciplinary. Mm. It doesn't just require some of our garbage change, there's sustainability of the species, there's all the other things that come into the Green Agenda, and the Department of Education has got no ideas on this whatsoever. Let's go back in the room. <laughs> Very clear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe here, and then on, maybe on the other side. Just wait for the mic. Oh, hang on. Let's start there, then. Thank you. Uh, Emma Bow, Department for Education. Well, I'm not sure I should admit that. <laughs> <laughs> Very brave, thank you. I was really interested to note that in all three of your opening statements, special educational needs didn't really factor into them at all. This is a cohort of 1.5 million pupils and it's only growing. How much do you think your recommendations from the commissions generally would speak to that cohort and how much do you think we need a new approach and a new impact? Thank you. Hold that thought. We'll get a couple more questions uh, in. One here and then one this side, just here. And then across there. Hi, uh, Chris Spencer. I'm a former head and now I've gone back to teaching Lord Baker geography. And my question is, you've made some very broad statements about teachers not enjoying teaching. My experience is that's not the case. Um, but I think an important part of teaching that in many reports isn't mentioned at all is warmth. The communication of warmth in a school, in a classroom. Uh, for me, the most important thing 
uh, beyond the curriculum, uh, beyond exams, mm -hmm. is to be able to role model what it is to be a warm and caring human being. Very good. We'll take one more question here, then I'll pass those back to the panel. <coughs> I work with these children that we are talking about and I totally agree with Lord Baker that the curriculum needs to change and be more hands-on for a lot of the children because the children are our future and if you don't do something now we are going to face a really bleak you know future for the children. So what is stopping us from implementing the changes now? Very good. Let's go down the line and maybe you can pick off whichever question you want, Rachel. <coughs> the, I'll start with the special educational needs because I think it's such an important issue and in fact we had a whole chapter on it in our commission report. Um, which I don't know whether this was right or wrong, but uh, I combined with alternative provision because there seems to be such a sort of tragic crossover between children with special educational needs and children who end up in alternative provision, excluded from mainstream school. Um, and one thing that really stuck in my mind is a parent who said, talking about their own child, and he said, the thing is, my child is treated as if there's something wrong with them. It's not that there's something wrong with them, they're just different. They don't fit into this box that um, the system expects them to fit into. Uh, and I think it goes back to this feeling of um, we need to respect and value all different kinds of children and all different kinds of talents. Um, and it was Howard Garner, I think, who said, ask not how, uh, how intelligent a child ask is, ask how a child is intelligent. So there are different forms of intelligence and different forms of achievement. Um, and to somehow, I think children with special educational needs in our system are too often valued or, or sidelined. And there are ways in which the system, leaving aside the whole absolute scandal of the funding and the assessment and the 98%, I think it is, of appeals that have found that to be wrong and you know the, the ruling was wrong so I think it's a really huge issue and nobody quite has an answer because I think it involves probably quite a lot of money. <laughs> May I speak to the uh, retired head master? <coughs> you shouldn't retire. People need you. How old are you? 64. 64? 61. What 61? I'm 27 years older than you are. <laughs> um, People are needed, and I would give head teachers much greater power. Instead of the Progress 8, Progress 5, English, Maths, Two Sciences and Data Skills. Every school should do that, then it should be you as head teacher in the area where you are to decide the extra subjects which are suitable for your area and which children and local employers want. I would, that's how the system should now develop, not the Department of Education telling you all to do this rigidly. And I think that can certainly come about uh, with changes after the next election. So don't give up. I'm, uh, I'm glad that Rachel mentioned H Howard Gardner because the emotional intelligence is something that we, we lose at our peril. I'm very pleased that uh, our colleague from the DFE mentioned special educational needs because it brings us back, does it not, to the commission and pupil-centred provision where we tailor the system for the student, not the student for the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we try and get back to that idea of looking and you, you need the resource to do it, you clearly do. Uh, in special education needs it varies from the, the input for support for the individual pupil all the way through to an understanding as we didn't have in the past uh, of uh, hidden challenges like autism, which people have identified and have been able and are struggling still to be able to, uh, to, to, to work with, but will in the future be absolutely fundamental to getting uh, youngsters to be able to succeed to the best of their ability. And that brings you back to the, the whole question of what education is for. And it's got to be about 
developing a young person's capacity to become a thinking, feeling, emotional, and yes, warm adult who can make a contribution not just to their own well-being and, and the growth of a family, whatever that family might look like, but actually make a contribution to a community that's worth living in, which is why I'm vehemently still in favour of citizenship education. The, um... We're into overtime, but I can't resist asking one more question of the panel, which is to grant you all a single manifesto wish. So if you were writing the, the manifesto of any party tomorrow, Rachel, what would be your one thing you could not have in it? I would say go for the British Baccalaureate and change the assessment system, because the, the assessment system is the tail that wags the dog. If you don't change that, everything else follows from that. Curriculum, you know, Ofsted, everything follows from that. If you change the assessment system, that will, that will every, other things will follow. Terrific. Ken? Um, very simple. Uh, remove Progress 8 and replace it with Progress 5. That would automatically lead to a change of assessments as well. David? Gosh, well, I, I, I've tried to write something of a manifesto on learning and skills uh, for my own party. Whether uh, most of it will survive the process, I don't know. I mean, if I was being cheeky, I would say I'd like the manifesto to say education, education, education. <laughs> <laughs> and then fulfil it through. I, t um, I think we, we need to think differently about how we learn through life so that we can build microcredit, modular approach with a learning passport that you can build on bit by bit. That would get us out of this terrible nightmare of teaching a particular type of GCSE maths that youngsters then struggle with and then they get taking it again and again in further education feeling a bigger and bigger failure when what they need is to be able to build it incrementally to meet the challenge of whatever job they take The on. task that David has is to persuade his party to believe in him and the task I have is to persuade my party to believe in me. <laughs> <laughs> And the task we have at the Times is to persuade the parties to believe in both of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic way to end what's been a, a, a fantastic conversation. And not the end of it, plainly. We're just starting. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, online, uh, in the room, for contributing so actively. And for I apologise we didn't get through more questions, but there was huge amounts to cover. Huge thanks to Camino, uh, our partners uh, this evening and over a long uh, period. We'll be taking forward tonight's discussion in partnership with Camino. And a big uh, thank you and shout out in particular to Bill Lucas, who has been uh, orchestrating uh, tonight's uh, events uh, so fantastically. For those interested, uh, in the chat online, there's tons of stuff about RSA work and design for life and how to become a fellow. And for those online who want to continue the conversation, you can now do that with our fantastic new digital platform called Circle. For those uh, in the room, uh, we'll continue the conversation downstairs in the Benjamin Franklin room over a drink. I hope as many of you as possible will join uh, us there. And finally, uh, let me just extend a huge Thank you to tonight's uh, fabulous speakers, to Rachel Sylvester, David Blanca, and Kenneth Baker, for what's been a fascinating, timely, and topical conversation that we hope that the RSA to take forward and make real changes to in the way we've heard about this evening. Please join me in thanking them. Thank